and let's get started. Hi, I'm Renee Hobbs, and tonight's, I don't know, what day is it already, for God's sakes? <gasps> the 24th of March. I'm here with the amazing COM 416 students. It's the spring 2017 semester. We are in really getting close to the end of the semester. I think we're in week eight or so. Uh, our topic this week is 20th century propaganda, and I am here with Nicole, Francesca, Nikita, Zoe, uh, I see Matt, I see Taylor, I see Kaylin, I see Mira, um, and we have like a whole lot of things to cover. So last time when, um, before spring break, uh, we didn't have a live class because I was in uh, Italy and I couldn't stay up that late. Um, and I was really so very fortunate to be, to be able to give a whole bunch of speeches all over uh, Rome on the topic of propaganda and fake news. But tonight, guess where I am? I'm in, I'm in Jerusalem, Israel. Uh-huh, yeah, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm giving a speech on um, propaganda and fake news uh, in Tel Aviv next week, so I thought I'd come for the weekend on, um, you know, have a, get a little spirituality here in the original holy city. Um, so, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, it seems like weird that, you know, I got, I got Italy and one kind of spiritual capital and here now Israel, another kind of spiritual capital. Very exciting. Happy, happy to be here, but especially happy to be with you guys. Um, okay. I'm going to share my screen with you and um, let's, uh, let's take it away. Of course, I couldn't help but put up the amazing oil paintings of Norman Rockwell as the picture for tonight. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Uh, I was really impressed with, I'm just starting to look at the Flipgrid the comments that you made now, is really impressed with the way, um, the way that you, uh, you handled that topic um and so um in some ways one of the things i i wanted to do was i wanted to um it introduce you oh here i, I put it never mind i wanted to oops i wanted to introduce you to how i read the uh article that we read because um because this week i'm going to ask you to do some a digital annotation. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if you've used a digital annotation tool before? A digital annotation tool? It's when you kind of highlight an online document. No, you have, yes, and Matt, Matt's hands are up. Okay, thanks, Matt. So there's a lot of digital annotation tools around, um, but the one that I'm going to introduce you to uh, and ask you to use for next week. It's really cool. It's a Chrome extension called Kami, and that's spelled K-A-M-I. And I think if you see my page, you're going to be able to see the annotations. Uh, this document is a PDF that's been uploaded to um, my Google Drive, and I've shared it with anybody on the, in the world who wants to read it along with me. And as I read, I'm kind of paying attention to, well, what the author is doing, the moves the author is making rhetorically. So I first notate how um, this Four Freedoms thing was going to be a total flop, right? And then, you know, thank God for Norman Rockwell. And so I note the author surprises me with this claim, and that makes me kind of curious and want to read more, right? And um, I loved the point that the author makes about how many ideas start out humbly and develop over time. Can you now in the, um, on the page, can you guys see my little annotations there in the margin? Give me a thumbs up if you can actually see those, right? So I can highlight, I can annotate, and I can even add text to this document. Um, of course, I'm really intrigued at the role of Norman Rockwell's um, contribution in making this space famous. Do you know that I visited the Norman Rockwell um, home and gallery out in uh, 
I want to say Sturbridge, Massachusetts, but I think it's called Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And I never knew that Rockwell did this on his own. I always thought he was commissioned by the White House to do it. I didn't know it was his own choice. So that was a big aha uh, for me. So the process of reading um, actively allows me to sort of synthesize as I go along. I was also fascinated at how most Americans didn't know why they were being asked to fight over in Europe. I, you know, we just naturally assume, well, of course we understood, you know, Hitler was a bad guy, right? But it turns out that actually during this time period, you know, most Americans didn't want anything to do with the, going over to Europe and didn't give a shit about what was going on in Britain. Right. So as much as Roosevelt was trying to create an enemy, right, uh, the American public really didn't care so much about that. Now, you guys might not be aware of this, but here's where my own background knowledge changes the way I read. Uh, it turns out that twice in this article, the um, author refers to these researchers. And these researchers are actually really important in the history of the field of communication. This guy, Hadley Cantrill, for instance, he wrote a really famous paper about the War of the Worlds broadcast. Do you guys remember that? The fake news, the original fake news broadcast, right? Um, and then the whole idea that the White House and FDR, that they were, they were botching this communication campaign altogether, right? They weren't even in, the consistent in the way they used the four freedoms. Uh, but, you know, thank God for Pearl Harbor, bring some momentum. But really, the FDR White House is like really fucking things up. The vice president adds more freedoms. You know, he thinks there's seven freedoms. So he gets things all confused. The White House campaign was a flop, right? But thank God. Ah, really interesting. Check out the, um, you know, who knew that a footnote could be so interesting? advertisers riffed on the four freedoms, including a Marshall Field and Company ad that pitched the benefits of the four freedom bra, freedom from separate bra, freedom from twisting, freedom from sagging, freedom from tugging, right? It's like, holy shit, they used it to advertise a bra, right? So this idea of digital annotation is actually a really great way to just document your own reading process to identify the ideas that are most important and that um, you know basically help you uh, make sense of the document. Um, so one of the things I thought would be cool for us to do is what do you say we have a discussion about the four freedoms speech but using what we read in the scholarly article to connect to two different um, to two different short videos. So right here, I've, I'm going to break you into two teams. Uh, we're going to watch just a short four-minute video. One is about the Four Freedoms speech itself, and the other is about Norman Rockwell's art. So um, give me a thumbs up if you kind of know what's going to happen. We're going to break into two teams. We're going to each talk about what we're going to watch one of the videos and talk about it a little bit. Then we're going to come together as a large group and talk about the connections between the two videos. So thumbs up if you got what we're, we're aiming for here. Okay, so I am going to, let's see if I can do this now. I gotta, sh I, think I, have to, I think I have to stop sharing. Oh yeah, there we go. I think I have to stop sharing before I can put you in a breakout room. I'm just gonna break you up into two groups. And here's the groups, Kaylin, Mira, Matt, and Taylor. You guys are going to watch the first video, which is called the Four Freedom Speech. And Nicole, Zoe, Nikita, and I, we're going to watch the Norman Rockwell speech. So first, before I open the breakout room, why don't you take four minutes to watch uh, the video you've been assigned. And then, it, since it's four minutes from now, then I'll open up the breakout room, okay? All right, so make sure you put your microphone on mute while you are watching.
everybody getting sent to the lead two videos using the link? Yeah, every time I click on the link, I'm just it's bringing me to the leap two video. Yeah, me too. Me yeah, too. me too. Can't even find the link. Yeah, I, I'm I'm looking at that, going, "Holy shit! What happened to that link? It disappeared." So let's all watch the four freedom speech. All right, to hell with this breaking up into two groups. We'll all watch the uh, Norman Rockwell video instead. All right. Yeah, all right. Your it's microphone not and we'll watch the Norman Rockwell video. That's the second video. Oh, okay. Norman Rockwell. We'll watch that one instead. Everybody, both teams. I'm still having trouble finding the link. We're still having trouble finding the link. Is that true? Uh, no, I got it now. Okay. okay good. Sorry.
Okay, give me a thumbs up when you've finished watching the video. Great, great. Okay, so um, this is, is a video by an art historian, right? And she's really inviting us to look carefully at the um, images. But um, we know that there's a lot left out of this description of the um, four freedoms. And so let's just say we were going to create a different video and we wanted to fill in the gap with what the art historian left out. Why don't we just go around the room and see if we can figure out, you know, if we were to make our own video based on our reading, uh, what, what was left out of this video that we'd want to include if we really wanted to educate people about the four freedoms? Who wants to go first? Yeah, Kaylin. I don't know if this is 100% right, but I feel like it didn't really focus on why they were created and like the political aspect of it, which I think was important because reading the article from last week, it talked about how Norman Rockwell tried to read the Atlantic Charter and how he didn't even understand it. He's like, I couldn't even get through the first paragraph. So he did these paintings that he thought were going to be used as like posters, like government posters. And then it turned into being these like iconic paintings that I, like I mentioned in my Flipgrid, were in my textbooks in high school. Right. But the context in which these were originally created as the uh, effort to move us out of isolationism and into involvement in World War II, that's completely omitted from this. So we definitely want to include that. Good. Let's keep going. We're making our own video about the four freedoms going beyond the look at the artwork to identify stuff that was left out. Like what? Nikita. Um, they could talk, we could talk about how um, the illustration sort of revived the entire concept of the four freedoms and how it was pretty dead until he even made them. I think, I think that is a huge, huge thing. You know, FDR tried to communicate the four freedoms and the White House well, bungled it so badly. But thank God for Norman Rockwell riding in on his white horse. Good. What else? That's two big ideas we can put in our video. What else? Matt? Uh, I think we should, uh, they should have focused on like why these values were important. Like they didn't really explain it. Like they didn't explain why at all. They were just like, okay, these are important for whatever reason. And I think the paintings definitely like bring that aspect into it. And that's kind of what hooked everybody. <laughs> that's a great point. Where did these ideas come from? Why are they important? Why were they important to, to FDR? That's completely omitted. We have to include that. Where, what's, what's these American values, right? Where, where did they come from? What's their, what's their strategic purpose? Good. A couple more. What ideas could we put in our video uh, about the four freedoms that wasn't in, um, in, the, in, this art history, in this art history one? One thing I would like to put in into into it is uh, a part. There's a part in the article that says something like, uh, "Once the White House figured out how popular the Norman Rockwell paintings were, the Saturday Evening Post magazine covers, they started reproducing them everywhere, right? And they started making tchotchkes, right? And they even put them in department stores and and did like a a department store tour." where people could come to the department store and see them, right? So the idea that they were uh, used as a means to sell war bonds, right? And as a kind of marketing the war, um, I think that's important to recognize, right? So in some ways, the, the story of 20th century propaganda is way, way too complicated just to handle in one week. But one of the things I like about this case study is it helps us understand that propaganda from the top down doesn't always work, right? As we saw with FDR's failure and his White House failure. When, when an artist working at the grassroots level, right, was able to 
turn those abstract ideas into stories, right? Stories, stories that people could relate to, that propaganda was highly, highly effective. So I think there's a lesson there for us today. Uh, and it's interesting to think about uh, how artists are contributing to um, the, the, the spread of propaganda in the 21st century. Um, okay, so um, let's see. So we've talked a little bit about propaganda and the four freedoms. We've discussed the, at least one of the uh, videos that I was hoping to look, look at. Um, I want to talk a little bit I'm, I'm, I'm just finishing up feedback on Leap 2. Uh, Zoe and I have been watching your Leap 2s, and we'll, we'll have, try to have feedback to you by certainly by tomorrow, before the weekend. But we know that in only one week, seven days from now, you'll be submitting your Leap 3. So uh, we're going to just review the Leap 3 specifications, talk a little bit about uh, your need to find a partner and to get started on this project. Then Zoe's going to give a dem demonstration of how to use PictoChart. Um, and, um, mm, and we'll be off to the races. First things first is that um, not, ev not even everybody in this class, I don't think, has developed a committed relationship, so to speak, with a partner. So this is our page for finding a partner. If you already have a partner, will you just do me a favor and put your partner name, put your partner name there where it says already committed partnership. I was really glad to see Dre and Aaron tweet their partnership, so that helped me to put that up there. I see Maddie, Shannon, and uh, Tina are ready to find partners. Um, partnership should happen today. Today you should find your partner. And the people uh, who are coming to this, uh, to this a, a class could make a great a partner team, okay? So um, you're really gonna be doing comparison and contrast. And if you're not familiar with a comparison contrast essay, you can learn more about it there. And we've been talking a lot about how you might go about the process of selecting examples of propaganda. So I'm gonna show you uh, a, at least a tool to get you started to think about the historical you have to connect the present to the past, and that's the trick. You have to gather information, right? I'm expecting you to write a pretty substantial um, a paper, uh, approximately eight to 12 pages, including a title page, an abstract, and an APA formatted works cited page. You're gonna submit this paper as a Google Doc, because I'm gonna provide you feedback on it as a Google Doc, right? Then, only really after your academic paper has a shape, you're going to explore PictoChart. Give me a thumbs up if you um, have received your coupon code and established your PictoChart Pro account. Have you gotten your PictoChart, your, the email from me and started your Pro account? I hope so, um, because that PictoChart account gives you lots of access to uh, templates and really makes it a very powerful and professional tool. And you, you've, you've got that pro account for four months, right? So definitely enough time to get you through the semester. Um, um, you're gonna put it all together by embedding your academic essay as a Google Doc and your infographic on each one on your own blog and tweet out a hashtag. And then, don't forget this part, when it's all over, you're going to write me a short reflection about the collaboration. This is really a learning experience that's not just about uh, com com connecting the past to the present, but also about collaborating in a digital media environment, right? And what that is like for you and what you learn from it. Because it's easier than ever to collaborate now. You don't even have to be in the same time or space, right? Um, but everybody has to do their part. And then I'll send you a link to a little survey so that your grade, uh, because this is a collaborative grade, your grade will partly be based on the work of your partner. <coughs> Whoa, whose dog is that? <coughs> that is an hey. adorable dog. Quit being an ass <laughs> uh -oh. Something bad happened at Mira's house. Yeah. That dog done something bad. All right, do take a look at the criteria for evaluation. This is the criteria I'm going to use to grade your um, 
leap uh, to it's worth 150 points. So um, really this uh, leap three is like the difference between an A and a C. <laughs> so it's kind of a kind of a, it's kind of important and make sure as you um, do complete your work you read each sentence and go have we done that and you read each sentence have we done that have we done that because we're that's how we're gonna grade your work okay um, so let me just see what questions you have about leap three before I move on what questions do you have Who has questions? Kaylin. Can we use the same website that we use for Leap 2 to find examples? Yes. Okay. Yes, what a good idea. <laughs> what a good idea. Can you use the Mind Over Media example uh, website to find contemporary examples? Absolutely. And check this out. You can use this website to find historic examples. You know, on the Mind Over Media website, I only include stuff from I mean, the oldest thing there is from like 2003, and you guys have to go into the past. So I wanted to make sure that you had some support. Um, oops, sorry. I wanted to make sure that you had some support for doing that because this isn't a history class. How do you find examples from the past? So check out what I found. This thing is so cool. It's called the Museum of Public Relations. There it is, the Museum of Public Relations. Check this out, this is so, so cool. Somebody from Hofstra University has developed a, oh, hold on here, I've got like a, too many windows open. Hold on, how many windows do you need open? Okay, there we go. Um, this person has done a public relations throughout the ages, and if you look at it, it is a history of propaganda, right? And it starts back, with the cave paintings, right? <laughs> Holy shit, that's going way back, right? And then it goes all the way through the age of empires into uh, the faith-based spread of propaganda as spirituality, then in the Western philosophy, right? Then into Europe, it turns out, did you know that um, uh, stained glass is a form of propaganda? right? Stained glass art is a form of propaganda. St. Paul the Apostle, that guy was a propagandist. He was probably the best propagandist. He made, you know, Christianity what it is, right? So it just goes on and on and on throughout history. And it, it should inspire some really good thinking. And then it's got links to where you can learn more. But it gets, it, it goes way back. But if I keep scrolling, uh, it, it gets really, really interesting in uh, the, uh, after, oh, after the printing press is invented, <laughs> right? Propaganda gets crazy, right? So as you're poking around, um, realize that you, when you have to use propaganda from the past, um, it can be, it can be any, any, it can be any past. Any part of the past, the abolitionists use propaganda to try to get rid of slavery, right? Um, the mass media guys who invented the radio, right? The photograph, right? Our most famous New England propagandist, P.T. Barnum. You should go the next time you're in Connecticut, stop in at the P.T. Barnum Museum. The guy basically invented entertainment culture right, and was a colossal propaganda, propagandist with um, all of his hoaxes, right, all of his hoaxes and exhibitions. So I think you'll enjoy that website and I think it will really be helpful to you. Um, now, Zoe, I'm wondering if um, you can talk to us a little bit about the use of PictoChart. Can you give us a short demo on PictoChart so students feel comfortable about how they might use it to build a comparison contrast diagram? Uh, mute your, unmute your microphone. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I believe every one of you have already uh, signed up for a free account, right? And so uh, we already get the coupon for uh, a pro account where um, 
just a, I don't know if everyone have you, uh, everyone of you have redeemed it, but if you have not, just go to magic dot pick magic dot uh, picture chart dot um, dot com slash redeem, and then enter your code and your account will be upgraded to a pro account where you can uh, create uh, uh, you know infographic uh, using their pro um, template and also um, uh, without the uh, watermark, right? Um, Let me. You're going to share your screen now? Uh, yes. Here. Um, here, I'm sharing my screen now. Here we can see is the. Um, um, So when you have uh, when you have signed up for it, you can take a tour where you can uh, learn how to create. Uh, this is not working. Um, we where you can create uh, uh, create uh, infographic charts here. Um, the templates are awesome. There, there you go. You're showing the templates. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you can uh, uh, create your infographic uh, using their template, and you can also um, here create a brand new one with uh, nothing. But you know they have a very creative template for you to use. Uh, uh, it's easy to use. Um, so here are their templates. Um, for example, maybe we can choose one as a comparison. Or just randomly choose um, a template, right? Yep. And they're designed as uh, blocks. So as you select uh, each box, you can choose different colors, you can customize them, and you can choose different um, font as you may think will uh, um, grab your audience's attention. Here are a very um, you know, useful tools like shapes and lines where you can just select one and drag them, shape them as you want, right? And also, we have icons. Um, who doesn't like emojis, right? <laughs> also, with the pro account, you have plenty of, uh, you know, already established uh, photographs. And here is where you can choose different themes, for example, uh, social media or technology, whatever you want. Um, and also, finally, we have photo frames. And using those, uh, you know, blocks, you can select and you can choose to put it, to arrange them, to put it forward, backwards, you know, whatever you want. We're just, just a little though and you can lock them as well, right? And um, also, there are backgrounds where you can choose or you can, uh, you know, change them as, uh, you know, you want. And also, there are texts. There are different types of, you know, uh, fonts and frames that you can use. Um, here's a very useful tool for you. You can utilize your information, your data using charts. These charts are very, very easy to use. You can select different types through here, depending on how you want to present them, right? And, uh, or you can use maps. I, I find this is very interesting uh, tool to use. You can select region and country. You can change the color, the shape, and you can add on uh, your information, your text, and also maybe add a chart. And also, here is a, here, um, 
when you analyze or compare or con uh, contrast uh, different examples of propagandas, you may also want to show your audience your video. And here is a useful tool for you. Uh, you can insert your video URL here. One of the things I love about that, Zoe, is that means that these infographics are not static infographics, they're dynamic yeah, infographics, yeah. right? Yeah. And that really, of course, is a really powerful tool. Once you guys make this infographic, it, if you're proud of it, it's the kind of thing that um, many employers are really uh, <laughs> eager to have someone who has actually created one because infographics are such a powerful communication tool. So hopefully you'll make something that will show off your uh, academic uh, talents and your knowledge of propaganda past and present, but um, also your creative uh, communication skills as well. Exactly. And see, here's the video that you can uh, insert and you can customize as well. Um, cool. And also, uh, there's one thing that I felt is m might be a little bit limited is that uh, you, you cannot um, share your right your uh, your production with right. the partner um, right once you log in with the same account right right so that actually is a great observation it's we uh, unfortunately picto chart does not let two people collaborate on the same document mm -hmm. so this will oh. require a certain level of divide and conquer or like you said zoe a sharing of accounts and i did not say that you should do that but if you did, that would be the only way you could collaborate. <laughs> and, but, but when you uh, finish or saved it, or uh, when you share, you can uh, clear on the share button and you can, uh, for example, um, leap three, and you can share with your teammates uh, using a password. Oh, that nice. Partner, yeah, that, that way your partner can enter the password and um, look at it, you know, uh, before you finally publish it as a, you know, um, finished uh, product. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Okay. That's yeah, you can uh, save it uh, as PDF or as, or just uh, copy the link and embed it, embed it onto your blog. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, students, what questions do you have about making an infographic? All right, let's do a temperature check. Uh, Zoe, you're going to release your screen there, or I guess I can request remote control. I'll do that right now. I'm going to request remote control. Uh, okay, that's, oh, oh, now, now I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Let's, ooh, ooh, ooh. Hold on here. So I'm just going to take people's temperature and make sure uh, that you're at least more or less comfortable. So um, I asked you to do this once before, but you should be feeling like even more freaked out now because it's due like in seven days. Okay, so feeling calm, cool, and collected, that's a five. Feeling freaked out that this is due in seven days, that's a one. Put your fingers up. Where are you? on your preparation. Uh, I see some ones, I see some threes, I see some, oh, there's, Nikita's a split personality, I see that. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, so let your creative juices flow, both in terms of writing the academic essay and in terms of writing, the, of composing the infographic. I have a question. Yeah. Does each person have to write an eight to 12 page essay? No, 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 you are collaborating. So, oh, so like the whole okay. class or? No, no, you and your partner are right, writing. Like eight pages? You and your partner are writing an eight to 12 page essay and creating an infographic. You and your partner are doing that work together. Okay, okay, okay. I, th I thought it was one, one, one person. I'm gonna sign oh, yeah. That's Hassan. Hi. Hi, how are you Hassan? Nice to see you. Hi. And so what questions do you guys have about this assignment? Are we, co are we feeling calm, cool and collected? Um, I, I have a suggestion. I think uh, when cr creating the infographic, you might want to look at the, you know, um, uh, template first and give you some like ideas to brainstorm and see what kind of com compare and contrast and visualize uh, your ideas. Yeah, you sure probably won't be able to get all the ideas in 
that's partly why you have to really write the paper first and figure out what are the three or four really important ideas and then and then create the infographic but for a lot of people their writing and their visual communication kind of go together and so maybe you will find that you create the both of them at the same way and that helps you develop your ideas uh, Taylor I saw your hand was raised what's your question so we're putting our infographic on our blogs but we're up Loading the um, paper on a Google Doc? Yes, and you'll make a link to the Google Doc on your blog. So when I go to your blog, I'll see a link to my link to my academic paper, and I click there and it will go to your Google Doc, which you'll make public so I can okay. see it. And then you'll also embed your infographic. Okay. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, Nicole. Um, your email with the coupon code is that do you still have to pay because I was trying to click no. level up and it's just bringing me to like a payment method nope so when, once you get your free account then mm -hmm. um, uh, how, how does she get to coupon coupon code Zoe uh, go to this link I'm gonna uh, put it in the chat in it's, the chat uh, yeah okay magic job pictochar.com uh, slash redeem Okay. 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 The chat, okay. Yeah. Somehow, when you press Thank level you. up, it doesn't want to let you use your coupon code. But if you use this, yeah, theme, it will. I'm glad you asked that question, okay. uh, Nicole, because I bet other people had that issue as well. What other questions do you have? Okay. So you're calm, cool, and collected. So let's talk about what I'd like you to do for next week. Um, so let's see. We've done a demo. We've talked about Leap Three. We've looked at the timeline of propaganda. Ah, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about your great critical analysis of the wall. I was really, really pleased with the work that you did here looking at this really remarkable propaganda film. And if you happen to be one of the first contributors um, to this video, you might want to take a look at it again. Um, one thing that I noticed is that you I think compared to where you are, were at the beginning of the semester, you guys are getting much better at noticing how the film is constructed in order to achieve its emotional effect. So in the beginning of the semester, many of you did not refer to the techniques of expression and communication that allow prop propagandists to evoke strong emotions, but now many of you are referring to not just what grabbed your attention, but how the filmmaker constructed the images in order to evoke your emotions. So this made me feel really confident that you are moving along really nicely in your strong uh, critical analysis of visual media. So I was really pleased to see that. I, of course, added my own comments to that uh, video just because I wanted to model the practice. And I think that's definitely worth re-looking at um, to see collectively, we know a lot. There's 27 students in this class or 28 students in the class. And when we put all of our minds together, it's really good. Okay. Um, here's what we're going to do for next week. Um, next week, our topic is demagoguery and fake news. Finally, after waiting the whole semester, the best topic of all, right? So I want you to listen to this short piece from NPR. I'd like you to read and post from uh, chapter six, we are, are we, we are All Americans Now. So after you read this, it's a short chapter. After you read this chapter, select a powerful quote from the chapter along with your image of your choice and upload it to the Padlet wall. We've used Padlet wall before. It's a pretty open space. I put up one as a model because I found an example of propaganda from the Islamic State. You double click anywhere, in the, um, anywhere on the wall and you can then, it opens up a little like a sticky note for you. So we're gonna take a look at what he, what his big ideas are about what 21st century propaganda looks like. Now, the reading activity for this week gives you a lot of choices. There are, in fact, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's seven different short articles from the New York Times or one scholarly article 
or the New Yorker, uh, the Atlantic, and other really great uh, sources. What I'd like you to do is select two of the articles below and use the Cami Chrome to highlight, comment, and annotate. To, to this evening, I showed you how, to, how I did that with the FDR article. If you click on this link, use Cami Chrome, you'll get to a four minute video about how to install, okay? Okay, so you can follow the directions there, but notice what's gonna happen is, um, what I'd like you to do is highlight, read, highlight, comment, and annotate. Demonstrate your critical reading skills through digital annotation. Be sure that at least three of your annotations include a summary, a comment and a question, and then compose four tweets to capture some of the key ideas you learned. Since the topic is fake news and demagoguery, I will be awarding a prize, and I mean an actual physical prize, for the best tweet of the week, right? So you're gonna use that hashtag 416 so I can find it. The topics are fantastic. Check out this one. This is a PDF. Now it's taken a while. You know, it's really interesting because when I'm using, um, aha, yeah, the real story about fake news is partisanship, right? And notice how it loads up in my cami, so I can I can highlight, I can strike through, I can underline, I can comment. Highlighting and commenting are going to be your major two things you're going to do here, right? So it's a pretty short article, but it's really about this deep partisanship between the Republicans and Democrats that's really you know, hurting our democracy right now. And that's the real fake news. Uh, this article from Megan Garber, what we talk about when we talk about demagogues, right? What does the word mean, demagogue? And what does it mean to be a demagogue? And uh, is Trump a demagogue? Um, this is a really fascinating short article about um, this loaded word demagogue and whether or not Trump is a demagogue is a kind of an open question right now. There's a wonderful article by Nicholas Lehman called Solving the Problem of Fake News, an article by Nathan Heller called The Failure of Facebook Democracy. It's about the question of whether fake books can use labeling and algorithm to um, make uh, our Facebook feeds more truly democratic. Of course, I've been fascinated at the rise of the alt-right. And so some of you will really enjoy this article called, Is the Alt-Right for Real? Um, which is a really fascinating article about the different constituencies that are coming under that, the conspiracy theory folks and the trolls and the um, fascists and the racists and the anti-Semites uh, and the revolutionaries who are all kind of bundling together under the term alt-right. You might enjoy this really interesting article, which is about the history of right-wing propaganda. And it takes us back to the very um, origins of um, uh, uh, um, the Tea Party. And it, it looks at, it's got stuff about uh, some of the people who are running the White House right now, back in the day when they were members of the Tea Party and what they were doing to advance the Tea Party movement. Uh, and then finally, um, because I know that at, at least uh, one of you is a dedicated conspiracy theorist, uh, and I'm looking at you, Francesca. <laughs> Um, this is a really great article from the New York Times called He Calls Hillary Clinton a Demon, Who is Alex Jones? So uh, I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun reading and annotating these comments. Um, since we're doing this collaboratively, we're kind of going to be able to see each other's comments. So the fun will be responding to each other and, and, and adding value by doing the work collaboratively, and then also by synthesizing with these four tweets. So that's coming up for next week. Now what's really cool is, check this out you guys, this is everything you have to do between now and the end of the semester. That's it, the whole list. There's gonna be 
a leap th three that's due next week. Whew, this week's going to be an intense week for you. There'll be two more quizzes, and then there'll be leap four, and then la da, the semester will be over. And I'll be sad to see it go because I've been having such a great time with you. Um, but it does mean that the next month is going to be fast and furious. So, does anybody have any questions about what you guys are going to be doing for this week when we're going to next week we're going to take on the topic of demagoguery and fake news? Okay, it should be fun. All right, so let's see. We've done a whole bunch of different waves, right? We have done a whole bunch of different waves, um, but um, we haven't done funny faces yet, have we? No, we haven't. All right, so ready? I'm, I'm serious. Pinky's out. Pinky's out. Okay, those are our funny faces from Com 416. Thanks for having fun with me, guys. I'm Renee Hobbs. We had fun tonight. I'll see you guys next Thursday. Bye-bye.